Hey guys, welcome back to part 2 of the BMW N55 engine rebuild project. In this video, we install a new piston, new main bearings, new crankshaft, and seal the bed plate. Since the original engine had metal chunks the size of my fist, yet still somehow ran, I bought another engine on Facebook Marketplace, and that's the engine we're working on today. Check out the playlist to see the teardown video and more info on how I actually got it. If you'd like to see what the original engine actually sounded like despite having chunks of metal and a hole at the bottom, click the links in the description below. And before we start, hit that like button, like the piston hit the cylinder head on my original engine for the YouTube algorithm, just to make me feel a little bit better for spending so much money on all these bolts and gaskets and cleaning supplies and everything else. Now back to this engine that I got for cheap on Facebook. In the last video I disassembled it to see if it was worth saving and decided that it's actually a rebuildable engine. Since then I have been ordering parts and cleaning all the parts I could clean. I've tried a few different degreasers, but ultimately the regular brake cleaner and even the cheaper AutoZone brake cleaner seem to have been doing the best. I've also learned that using Scotch-Brite pad helped get rid of the tougher build-up stuff and kind of smooth out the contacting surfaces. Even though this looks easy and fast on video, it took hours to do. But I was also being very careful not to damage anything since I'm fairly new to this. Since the engine spawned the bearing on piston 6, I decided it would be best to replace it for a couple of reasons. The most important reason was that there was actually damage on the connecting rod where the new rod bearing would go, which of course would not last very long even with the new bearing in place. I also worried that the connecting rod itself could have been slightly bent, not that I would see it with naked eye, but you never know, or internally damaged, or even no longer perfectly round, and since I have four perfectly good pistons from the original engine, I just decided to swap one in. I picked the best out of the bunch, gave it a good clean, and then went to adjust the piston rings. Now it's a little bit difficult to see on camera, but the M-Flex ring is made from three different parts. Bearing spring being the middle, and two steel band rings that go on top and bottom. The idea is to get the M-Flex ring and the two steel bands to be 120 degree apart at the opening or the separation point. It's also important to make sure that the contact point is not arranged over what's called the pin boss, or basically avoid the area where the piston is connected to the connecting rod. Once you have the bottom ring properly adjusted, you need to also adjust the middle and the top rings to be 120 degree from each other. The instructions on this aren't super clear, but I went with 120 degrees for the three parts of the M-Flex ring, and then again 120 degree separation between the three rings. Now that I had my piston ready to go, I cleaned up the cylinder wall to make sure it was perfectly clean, oiled it, and oiled the piston as well. I don't have any fancy tools to install pistons, but honestly it was much easier than I expected. I used this $13 tool from Amazon and it worked perfectly. It's a little fiddly, yes, so if you do this a lot, definitely spend the money on something more solid, but for me, it worked exactly as I needed it to work. I oiled up the inside of the tool as well, just to make sure nothing got scratched, and tightened it around the piston. Then inserted the tool with the piston into the cylinder and gently pushed it with my fingers. You do not want to use any you know, big tools here like a hammer uh, to force it in. The new piston should just go in smoothly and easily with the force of your hands or fingers. The new piston is now installed, so woohoo! Having actually accomplished something, I decided it was time for a little bit more cleaning. I definitely learned that a big part of engine rebuilding is getting rid of all the old muck and gaskets and all kinds of buildup. If I were to do this again, I would definitely get a parts cleaner or maybe like a Dremel with a soft pad or something like that, just to make things easier. At least getting it to look new again does make you feel like progress is being done, so that's definitely a plus. Now that I felt better about how it looked, I removed the connecting rod bolts and the connecting rod bearing caps on the big end. It's very important that the connecting rod caps do not get mixed up and go to the correct connecting rod when reused, or you'll have another knocking engine very soon. I mark them and put them aside until they are needed again, when we replace the rod bearings in the next video. The bolts will also be used before the final install for testing, 
so I'm keeping them for now. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that video. Now the crankshaft is not being held in by anything, it can be simply removed from the engine. Do be careful as it weighs about 50 pounds and you don't want to drop it on your foot. I wanted to show you the difference between a good crankshaft and one that has been abused. Let's compare the crankshaft from the original engine to the one I'm going to be installing shortly. You can just see how much shinier and how much smoother the journals are on the good part. Of course, the old one's not going to go to waste, it can still be resurfaced and used again, but you will have to get, or somebody will have to get, oversized bearings. But it's clear that one has been really, really abused in a car and the other one well, probably not driven as hard. Or at least they probably changed their oil more often. Back at the engine, I removed all of the old crankshaft bearings, cleaned the area with some scotch brite, and removed the residue with the brake cleaner. And of course, a lint-free paper towel. We are now ready to install the new stuff. Since I'm going with the aftermarket bearings, you definitely want to make sure that it's the standard size. Right there, it's going to be indicated by STD. And it should be the same thing on every single one. As you can see, all of them have it. Otherwise, you might get an oversized one. I think they do have like 0 0.025 plus um, oversized bearings. You definitely don't want to put those unless you have uh, resurfaced your crankshaft or anything like that. So why am I going with aftermarket main bearings? Well, that's a very good question with a few answers. First, these seem to have a much better reputation with people that have been rebuilding their N54 and N55 engines. Second, these kink bearings have an improved crankshaft finish for reducing microscopic ferret peaks if your crankshaft isn't perfect. And since I'm not installing a brand new one, it clearly isn't perfect. It's great, but it's not perfect. They also have improved oil clearances, which should reduce wear on the engine and increase its life. Other than all of those reasons, the price was also a factor for me, as these are much less expensive compared to OEM. Installing these is actually fairly simple. Put the groove side in first, squeeze the bearing just a little bit and push it down with your fingers. They pop in and seat themselves when done correctly. At least they did in my case. You also want to check for any burrs or anything like that on the edge. You don't want to scratch your, um, your motor. This one seems okay. The set with the low oil hole goes on the engine block and the solid ones are installed on the bed plate. Of course, I cleaned all the surfaces to make sure there was nothing there before installing. It's very important. And as you can see, all the holes are lining up. So that's what we want to see. Same thing, you want to make sure all of them have the STD sign on it. You're going to mess up your engine. Now that everything is ready, we can temporarily install the crankshaft so we can check the crankshaft bearing clearance. If it didn't go in perfectly on the first try, don't spin it. Lift it out a little bit and put it back in where it goes in perfectly without touching anything. Ideally, we would take all of the pistons out, but since I don't want to deal with uh, removing all of the pistons and then reinstalling all of them correctly, I decided to leave them in. And as you can see, the idea here is that all of these connecting rods are not touching the crank so it's not in the way it's not gonna skew our measurements it is just sitting on its own in our main bearings so that's what we want and obviously do not spin the crank at this point to make sure the bearings have seated correctly and are not over or undersized it's important to check the crankshaft bearing radial clearance for this bmw recommends using plastic gauge I have a full video on how to use plastic gauge if you'd like to see the entire process. The basic process is to cut a piece of plastic gauge the width of the journal, place it on top of each journal you'd like to test, and then install the bed plate back on the engine. Even though this is just a dry test, I'm still trying to line it up as perfect as I can. So I'm looking for machine parts on both, on both parts, right, to make sure they line up. So you can see this one lines up pretty well. So does that one. And then if you go on the other side, there's even better indicators right there. So if I step back just a little bit, I'm gonna make sure they are absolutely perfectly straight. 
same thing on this side so yeah we definitely want to make sure it's lined up uh especially when we're going to be putting it back together completely like the final assembly but for now we still want it to be nice and straight so when we tighten these bolts right now you know our plastic dip or plastic gauge is going to be measuring correct tolerances which is obviously very very important for us right now we then followed the correct sequence to install the bolts and torque them to spec I left mine for a couple of minutes and then removed the bolts and the bed plate. So I'm going to torque these to 20 newton meters or it's about 14.75 pound feet of torque. Uh, then after you're supposed to do 70 degree turn after their torque. So I'm going to try to do as close as possible but doesn't necessarily have to be super technical here since this is not the final assembly. A lot of people I've seen just do 25 Newton meters and they're saying kind of it's the same thing. But I'll try to go more by the spec, not absolutely 100%, but close enough so I can make sure that this crank fits well within this, uh, this engine. And we always start in the middle when we're torquing them. Now that we have separated the bed plate from the engine block, we can see our plastic gauge has left us a mark. Uh, what I have noticed is that it kind of didn't stick to the actual crank, but fortunately it did stick to, to the bearings on the bed plate. So we can now measure what it is let's see all right so to me that looks uh, i would say between the 0 0.51 and 0 0.38 which is actually really really good those are good tolerances as far as i understand uh this for this engine it's supposed to be between 0 0.025 to 0 0.076 there are just a couple of corrections I wanted to make on the clearance. The crankshaft bearing play should be between 0 0.02 and 0 0.046. Now that I'm confident with the fitment of the new crankshaft, it is time to do the final assembly. Of course, I have cleaned all of the areas again and removed the plastic gauge from the crankshaft as well as the bed plate. With all of the surfaces clean, I then installed some assembly lube as this will be the only oil between the journals and the bearings when the engine runs for the first time. After the oil pressure is built up, regular oil will go through the holes in the bearings and lubricate, but we have to protect the engine for those first few rotations. I put some assembly lube on the bed plate bearings as well and even rubbed a little all over the journals directly. This stuff isn't going to hurt anything and it sticks much better to the surfaces compared to regular oil. Since there's no gasket between the bed plate and the engine block, it has to be sealed with a special sealant. The one I got is recommended by BMW and is specified in the service manual. I applied a good bead into the groove as specified. And yes, before you guys yell at me and say they have to put the bed plate on first and then use the little nipple to fill it up, I literally use the instructions that are for this engine and that's how BMW tells you to do it. If you don't believe me, I even got the little nipples. Let me see if I can get them. Look at that. I have them, but I'm going to go by what BMW says to do in their instructions, in their manual. So that's what I'm doing. Obviously, you see right here, apply sealant in area one and two, which is just the grooves. More sealant must be applied in the area of the injector nozzle, points to the arrows, and it clearly says 
nothing about replacing those injectors. Injector nozzles are no longer required. All righty, let's do it for the last time. Still perfectly aligned, as you can see, and that little goo came out, uh, or the sealant came out. Same here, if I squeeze a little bit, you can see it come out as well. Well, kind of hard to see on camera, but it's there. And it came out on the side as well, which is important. And on that side as well. So we know there's enough of it, just like there's enough here. And one thing we want to make sure that lines up is these areas right here. That tells us that the, the top and the bottom part are lined up. Same on this side. Everything looks really good. I'm very happy with this. Of course, I got all new bolts. It's very important that you replace these. Uh, you can use them for check-in tolerances and everything else and clearances, but definitely don't want to be reusing them for final assembly. I'm going to be using a torque wrench. It's set to 14.75 pound-feet of torque or 20 newton meters. And the way you want to start is in the middle. So you're going to go 1, 2, then it goes 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's the only way you want to be torquing these up. So it's very important that you start in the middle, work your way out. I heard everything gets squeezed in a little bit, so I'm rechecking, making, making sure everything is still aligned perfectly. And it is. We're ready. So we can continue. And each one that's torqued, I'm gonna mark with a marker as a straight line. That way when I'm gonna be doing my 70 degree uh, additional tightening, I'll know where, you know, where I need to stop. But not only that, I mean, that's not exactly what it's for, but this is so I know which ones have already been tightened. And once I'm doing the rotational torque, I'll see that, okay, these have been already rotated and I don't do it again, because that would be a big no-no. Now we're gonna set the torque angle, which is 70 degrees for these uh, crankshaft bolts. And you can use a couple of different tools. You can use something like this, or you can use something like this, or there's even torque wrenches that are fancy and expensive that will measure it for you digitally. I don't have that one, but I will use one of these. I'm gonna see which one works better for me in this situation. I'll just use this. This works just fine. All right, guys, so here's how I have it set up. I have a little clip that goes to this plate that shows me the degrees. Then I also have this needle that I locked with a knot in the back. So as you can see, I am at zero degrees right now. So now if I go see, 40, 60, 70, perfect. So I am exactly at 70. We have done 70 degrees of torque. Now if we lift it, there you go. You can see that it's been turned 70 degrees. This really is a very simple device, but it's pretty amazing how accurate it can be if you do it right. So I cut all the slack out, make sure it's already under tension. And I'm just doing my 70 degrees. Done. Look at that, all of them are pointing in exactly the same direction. So pretty good deal. Next, we're gonna replace the bed plate screws, which are the screws that go in here. There's clearly a lot of them and they are aluminum, so you have to replace them. There are a couple that are slightly different than the rest, so do pay attention which one goes where. Okay, so a little bit more on these bolts. We have a lot of them that are exactly the same. These are the M10 bolts and they're torqued to 15 Newton meters with 90 degree uh, of torque. Um, we have two that are longer and four that are M8 
uh, bolt or screws or whatever you want to call these. Now, these two longer ones, they go right here. As you can see, there's like raised area right there. So we're going to put these two longer ones in here, just like that. And the four M8 bolts go two on each side. right there. The rest of them just go in each one of these holes. And we're gonna be tightening them from the middle, kinda like that, in a circle. So here, 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 until we go all the way to the outside. These have to be marked as well, which is tedious, but very helpful. Now that we have torqued all of the bolts to the specified 15 Newton meters, we're going to do 90 degree of torque or whatever it's called. I don't really know, but we're going to start in the middle again, get that in there, secure our dial, that seems fine, set this at zero, and 90 degrees, that's it, now we're just going to do all of them, this is a lot of tedious work guys. All right, all of the bolts are now correctly torqued. As you can see, they were pointing up and down. Now they are horizontal. That means 90 degrees, which is pretty sweet. Took a lot of torquing, but hey, everything looks good. All right, this is getting very exciting. I'm so excited about this engine and I know some of you will say, hey, you didn't put enough or whatever. Like I said earlier, look how much came out. So clearly there was enough for it to spread around and come out of the holes where it's supposed to come out. And what I'm actually gonna do is use, um, there's like, a, what is it called? Primer, whatever this is. Uh, you basically dab a little bit at the end and it's gonna solidify much faster on this end and that. I don't know exactly what it does, but basically you're supposed to put it under to finish the job and it's gonna all seal in and get hardened faster. There are now only a couple of things we need to check to make sure everything that we have done so far has been successful and the crankshaft is installed properly. And the first thing we're gonna check is the crankshaft coaxial clearance. So that basically means how much it can move in and out. So I have pushed it as hard as I could with my fingers that way, set the dial to zero, and now I'm gonna move it or push it as hard as I can that way to see how much it moves. So if I understand this dial correctly, this has moved, or this has moved laterally this way, uh, 0 0.011 or 12 millimeters. Uh, and the tolerances I did just check, it's actually between 0 0.06 and 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So we're right in the middle. So I think that's perfect. Very happy with that. And the very last thing we're gonna do is check the coefficient of friction on the crankshaft. So this isn't the most accurate uh, tool I have probably, but we can still get more or less a decent uh, reading on it. So as you can see, to get it going, it's about three, but then once it's moving, it's between two and two and a half. 
I can't spin it any further because I have the pistons in. Technically, you're supposed to do this when the pistons are out, but I didn't want to take them out and deal with that stuff. So I only have a limited amount of movement I can do. But when it's moving, it's run right around two and a half. And the specs on this is between two and two and a half Newton meters. So I think we are pretty much within spec. I really hope you enjoyed this video or at the very least learned something new. If you enjoy this type of content or just like cars, check out the rest of my channel for many more car related videos. Most aren't nearly as technical. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in part three where we install the rod bearings.